So, um, moving forward, what I'd like to do now is start to address some more specific issues related to Indigo uh, itself, and specifically the way forward for you, the SPS users. Uh, all of you here in the room, as I said, are users of uh, SPS, and some of you in the room, we were joking about it over the coffee break earlier, have been users of the various generations of payroll solutions that we've provided to the market for many, many uh, years. So we started with the launch of SPS version 1, if you like, which was based on DOS back in 1990. There are some of you in the room here, or at least your companies, who were using that. I'm seeing one specifically nodding his head over there. Hi, Joe. Um, and um, there are some of you, of course, in the room that weren't born in 1990, so just for you to understand, that is quite a while uh, ago. Um, we moved into the version 2, still in DOS, back in 1993, and then in 2004, we launched the Windows version of, um, uh, of, it, of uh, uh, SPS. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't find any screenshots that we could recover from the first two versions, but we do have, obviously, the screenshot of uh, SPS. Um, and beyond that, obviously, the launch of Indigo in 2015, October 2015, when we launched the product and we went live in 2016, January 2016. And the thing that I think um, is core to what we have done towards that, uh, um, in, in, in all of that time, as we do in general with all of our solutions that we provide to you, is that we've been alongside you in that change uh, all the way, shadowing you, supporting you in the movement from one generation to the next. One generation of product, but one generation of technology. And this shadowing to us is a core ethos behind our uh, way of working. And it is, we believe, the main reason that we've got such a high client retention um, uh, with, with, with our products. So that's something we're very proud of and we work uh, hard for. Of course, when we started this journey towards Indigo, we looked at what are the core strengths of SPS. And I think most of you would agree with all of these strengths here, in terms of it being a practical, easy to use uh, solution, it being a reliable uh, solution, an evolving uh, solution, which has a low touch cost uh, associated with it, no uh, major elements um, uh, needing uh, attention, and what we call support plus. Not just the support that you phone us up to say, I'm trying to generate this report, where do I do it from, how does this work, I can't generate this report, whatever the support may be, but more support like, how do I actually implement the new pension schemes, or the new regulations for the handling of taxation on options. And rather than saying, well, can you please ring the Inland Revenue Department and ask them, because we know what that takes, we actually provide the plus in the support and offer you very often guidance at a considerable risk, I might add, at a risk in the sense that very often we're giving you guidance that really should be being given officially by the department uh, concerned. And obviously you should always confirm that guidance with the departments, but we feel that the plus in our support is very, very uh, important. And so these traditional strengths were absolutely cardinal to us, and we were determined and I'm sure that I can stand here very proudly saying that we have taken all of these strengths across into the Indigo uh, product. But new technologies have changed the way that we all work. There are new things that we want to do and new, th new things that we can do. 
And really, the result of this is that user expectations have changed. You as our users and other users not in this room have been asking us to do certain things which we can now do with the technologies and that is what we are providing with the Indigo uh, platform. And those users who two and a half years ago at the Hilton saw the product and already made that move are already taking the benefit of uh, these types of additional uh, capabilities. And so really, it's about moving the rest of you into the Indigo uh, platform so that you too can take the benefits of what Indigo is in a position to provide you with. And these expectations are not going to be new to you. They're expectations to be connected, to be 24-7 operational decentralized, not having to work necessarily from your offices or from a particular um, office. The ability to be able to work in the same way while on the move and to be much more collaborative in the way that you work. And these really are expectations that we all have and that you have the ability to take the benefit uh, of. However, we cannot meet all of those increasing expectations with the older technology on which SPS uh, was built. Let's actually recall that SPS was built and first launched back in 2014. We're talking about 14 years ago that this product, obviously it's evolved since its initial stages, but here we're talking about a technology that now needs to support things that didn't even um, exist or weren't even dreamt of uh, 14, uh, 14 years ago. The thing is that many software companies go through the process of stretching their products. They add a bit here, they build a bit more there, and you can do that to a certain extent. But the best companies start from scratch. They don't actually keep trying to push the boundaries of an existing technology. They start from scratch, but, this is important, they carry their clients with them. We don't leave our clients in the lurch. This is our 35th year of operating as Sherburn, and there are people in this room that have been operating, or their companies have been operating with us for 35 years. They have moved along, and we have helped them move along, and we've given them the capability to uh, move along carrying the clients with them, or our clients with us, is an important thing for us. Not just because it's good business, but it's good ethics. But to do that, you need a few things. First of all, you need a good strategy. You need to think out how to get from where you are today to where you want to be in three, five, ten, fifteen years uh, to come. You need courage. It's not easy to actually say, say, fine, we've got this product, we're going to keep it going, we're going to continue to consume the resources to keep supporting our clients, but we're also going to put this amount of resources into this other parallel track, which we're starting from scratch. So you need courage, and of course, you need financial strength to be able to do that, and you need a great team. All of those components we have at Sherburn, and all of the components is what we've used to put in to the Indigo uh, efforts. Now, as a result, really, we all must adapt. We're adapting, you need to adapt. Okay, this is a process that we're all uh, going through uh, together. And our mission at Sherbin is to support you in your own growth and to evolve with your needs over time. So we need to try and ensure that we are doing those things that our clients are going to need tomorrow and the day after to be successful in their own uh, business. So we started in January 2016, and as we had said to people at the Hilton, um, there's no particular reason for someone to migrate from SPS to the Indigo platform necessarily in January, at the start of the year, because we have 
full migration capabilities to allow you to migrate to Indigo at any time of the year. So what we did was we said that we would start gently, slowly in January of 2016. And this is what gently and slowly looked like. So <laughs> we've, we've had a massive ramp up of users on uh, Sherburn uh, Indigo. And you'll see each time we come towards the end of a the year, there's a natural increase like we had between October and December, and then a slight flattening off in uh, uh, post the beginning of the year. Now, that's, you may say, is unusual if we don't need to change everyone uh, at the beginning of January. The reason behind that is we currently got over 20, 21,000, as of yesterday, 21,000 employees being paid through the Sherburn Indigo uh, system at the moment. And as yesterday, that meant 1,238 companies uh, onboarded. The interesting thing is 75% of those have never been users of SPS before. I'll just say that again because it's worth mentioning. 75% of the people that we've onboarded have either not have a payroll before because they're new companies. There are some of those. Most of those are migrations, not from SPS to Indigo, but migrations from other payroll service providers in Malta that have moved to Indigo when they've seen that what we have provided to them. That is why that graph is actually um, impacted by the year-end process, with lots of people using other systems wanting to migrate at the beginning of the year. Of course, in your case, you don't have that issue. You can migrate whenever, uh, whenever you like due to our migration uh, processes. So these numbers are um, very, very uh, encouraging numbers. They're numbers which um, have really uh, been far uh, ahead of our expectations. And of course, since we met in, uh, uh, at, at the Hilton in October 2015, we've continued to enhance the product uh, even further with capabilities related to our attendance module, calendaring and eventing, um, improved visibility for leave even further on a basis of what we call my team so that a manager can look at just the leave related to their own uh, team with greater visibility. Heat maps showing the density of who is on leave on which days. So you look at a calendar and it's color coded depending on the number of people on leave on different days and you can change the coloring to um, uh, slide uh, according to what uh, you're looking at. Um, dual factor authentication. Uh, we'll talk about all of these uh, issues in more detail um, in uh, a few moments, but this is part of the, again, increasing depth of security that uh, we offer. Uh, corporate document distribution, integration with the Bamboo HR cloud-based system, and there are a whole load of other uh, capabilities that we've added. So um, what we've also done, however, is we've improved processes. And I wanted to mention this first one, no end of year, specifically, because although people who use SPS compared to other systems on the market think that the end of year is very easy to do, we thought it wasn't easy enough. So the way of making it easier was just to remove it. There is no end of year process. As you will be seeing, you'll be able to have visibility across multiple years, whether it's history or reporting, and no issue of having to remember and recall, ah, I only do this end of year once a year, let me phone to make sure that I'm doing it right. Okay? Eliminate that completely. This is part of the whole idea of simplification, um, which uh, we always strive for. Um, again, part of simplification is the self-service licensing. We'd have people on SPS who have a, user for, uh, a license for 40 users, and they've taken on additional staff this month, but no one told the person who's actually running the payroll, and therefore when they come to run the payroll, they can't onboard the additional staff because they don't have a license. 
and very often people are doing payroll after hours. Some of you have got part-timers, or some of you are people who do payrolls for your own uh, clients on a uh, subcontract basis. And in that type of situation, you might need to increase licenses on a weekend where our support is not available uh, to you. So we just said, again, eliminate the need to do that. If you need more licenses, if you need more users, you should be able to go into the system and um, purchase and pay for those new licenses online that you need 24-7. Uh, the same thing with the contracting uh, process, that you should be able to have access, and this is the way that you would uh, contract with us, you'd be able to have access to the contract, you'd be able to authorize the contract online um, and uh, store that within the system and even pay online for your subscriptions. Um, we've integrated email into the system. So many of you have a policy of emailing um, uh, pay slips to your staff, and you're doing that through your email, your current email system, and some of you have some difficulties in doing that because of limitations in your own email environment. So what we decided to do was give you the capability to actually do the integration directly and have the emailing being sent through the system. But we've also gone one step further. We say, why should we be emailing? Should you really be emailing through the email system the pay slips to the users? Because that means that the pay slips are going out over the internet. And as soon as anything goes over the internet in that context, it's not necessarily as secure as it needs to be. So although you can choose with some users to do that, you can also implement the system in such a way that people receive a notification by email with a link to their payslip, which gives them the capability to log in securely to obtain their payslip. So again, this removes the situation that you currently have with SPS, that your IT administrator, who is administering your email server, may have access, I'm not saying does have, but may have, there's a good likelihood that they have, access to the emails going out containing people's payslips. These are the types of issues that are addressed uh, here. In addition, what we've done is we've implemented extensive online help. I'll show you some examples of this uh, later, both in terms of field help on the employee form, but also online help, FAQs that will allow you to be guided as to how to do uh, different things. We've also implemented an online chat support. So uh, when you're in Indigo, if you do need some help from people, you can actually go on and ask a question online, and our support team will be able to answer you online. Uh, that makes it much easier rather than doing things through the phone, because you, you will find that while they're taking a phone call, they may actually be answering one or two different chats from those of you who are uh, needing some uh, support. Um, we've expanded the team. So uh, we're currently a team of 56 at Sherburn. Um, just to give you an idea, three years ago, we were a team of 33. So that's almost getting close to doubling um, our uh, numbers. And not only have we increased the number of uh, uh, people, but we've also increased new roles in the organization. So roles for people more dedicated to specific areas. For instance, we have now a full-time testing and QA department of five people as of last week, with the fifth person joining last week. Okay, so what's next? So I've given you some background. I've spoken about what we've done uh, so far. So let's look forward to what, uh, happens, uh, what happens next. Well, clearly, it's about migration. So here, we're here in front of you to indicate to you the benefits that you would gain the sooner the better you move towards the Indigo uh, platform. And our automated migration is designed specifically to remove the pain associated normally of migrating from one system to another, let alone a third-party system to uh, another. So the idea of simple, the idea of simplicity is core to the way we try and look at doing stuff. So 
when we spoke to you in October 2015, we told you we were opening up a parallel track, that we would actually continue to support SPS as well as the new Indigo payroll platform in parallel with each other, and we will continue to provide support um, uh, for both. In 2016, what we started to do in um, uh, uh, the early months of January, uh, sorry, the early months of 2016, was we started to migrate the users from um, SPS to uh, Indigo. And that is a process um, that happened in parallel with taking on a large number of new customers. So 75% of the customers are new. Many of those customers are customers that have hundreds, 500, 600, thousand users, thousand employees that are running through the Indigo uh, payroll. So we're not just talking about um, uh, onboarding small customers, but there is a big range of uh, customers. In 2017, last year, we stopped selling SPS to new customers while continuing to support you. Any new customers um, who came on board, who, who, who approached us, we only gave them the option of Indigo. At that time, in the early times, there were clients that we lost because there were clients, I would actually say there still are clients, reducing number, who actually say, no, I don't want anything which is in the cloud. More often than we hear, what we hear is, I don't want anything that is not in the cloud. So the discussion over the last two years has completely reversed. Today, we hear, no, I don't want something which is cloud-based, maybe once every five or six months. Okay? So that's the way that things have, have, uh, uh, have gone. So, in 2018 and 2019, we will continue to migrate the rest of the SPS uh, client base to Indigo. So, our roadmap is to do this in 2018 and 2019. And we would like all of you to be migrated by that time. Now, when I say by that time, there are also going to be blackout periods where we're unlikely to migrate customers. As you know, the end of year is a particularly busy period for uh, payroll, and therefore it is unlikely that we would be migrating SPS clients in those um, areas at the end of the year. So we will not be doing that in the, um, uh, in the cusp of um, December 2018 or in 2019. So in actual fact, we don't have all the time available, and it's a challenge to get um, the companies all to migrate. A challenge for us, as well as obviously for the companies uh, themselves. And why are we talking about 2019? Because we will be stopping support of SPS in December 2019. I'm just gonna say it again. We will be stopping support of SPS in December 2019. That means any budget changes which are announced in the budget of 2019, normally October-November time, any changes implemented there will not be put in to SPS. And therefore, 2020 will not be able to be processed in SPS with those changes if there are changes. Of course, if there are not changes and you choose to continue to use SPS in 2020, that is your choice, but we will not be providing support from the 1st of January 2020 uh, onwards. So this is very, very important, and I don't want to be misinterpreted uh, over here. We launched the product two and a half years ago. We've carried on with two parallel tracks and we will continue two parallel tracks. It will end up being that we will have had four years of parallel uh, tracks that we will support you with, um, with the product. But we will then be stopping SPS support as at uh, that time. Now, what happens to SPS support and maintenance contracts 
which don't start at the beginning of the year. For instance, a June 2018 renewal will be made to June 2019. That's fine. But a June 2019 renewal will only be made to December 2019. It will be a shortened renewal period. Those of you who do have support agreements which span beyond when you migrate, so let me give you an example. If you have a support agreement currently in, um, uh, in operation which covers you until the end of this year and you choose at the end of June to migrate to Indigo, you will receive a credit note for the remaining period unused which will be used against your subscription for Indigo. Okay? So any support process, any support service that you are paying for when you choose to migrate will be recovered by you and used towards your subscription of Indigo. So it's all about migration. Okay? So what we need to do is we need to work together, your team and our team, to ensure that we migrate you all to the new environment. So, let's talk about pricing. So, what is the subscription? Um, uh, well, first of all, the model is a subscription. You have a subscription, which is a monthly fee paid annually in advance, uh, usually, although we will be opening a monthly option at uh, uh, slightly higher rates, which is the traditional industry way of operating. And essentially, you would have a subscription fee of 360 euros for your first 10 employees. So that's not 360 each employee, just to be clear, but for the first 10 uh, employees, up to 10 uh, employees. Beyond that, if you've got additional users, what you would have is two options. You can either go down the route of just paying per employee. So you say, I want two employees more. And you can pay for two employees. Or you might want to add one employee. That's fine. Or you can buy employees in 10, <coughs> excuse me, in 10 user packs. And a 10 user pack will bring the cost per employee down to one employee per, sorry, one euro per employee per month. So you can see that this is a very, very um, attractive uh, option, a very attractive price. Um, which will give you a, an ability to scale up and down based on the number of employees that uh, you have within uh, your operation. So, essentially, if, you've got, if you need to buy three or more employees, you might as well buy ten employees. So you have the headroom to buy the ten employees so you can grow into those uh, ten employees. In addition, um, just note that obviously all these prices are excluding VAT. The prices are payable annually and um, you subscribe to the new employees uh, online. In addition to this, there is a one-time setup and migration fee. And here we put a price of to be determined. To be determined because it will vary based on the number of companies and the number of employees that need to be uh, migrated. So this is subject to uh, quotation to allow you to actually automate the process from one uh, to uh, another. And as I said, the uh, SPS support credit mechanism works for any um, current support contract uh, which is available. Now what does this include? Well, it includes all the hosting, it includes the service of data backup provided by um, uh, Microsoft, so we can uh, uh, rely on a very high fidelity data backup uh, environment. The security infrastructure that we make use of that Jonathan so clearly uh, explained. It also continues to provide unlimited support. Okay, so recall that we do not cap the support hours that we provide to you either today or in the future. We don't say support costs X for up to a maximum of 10 hours of support a year. 
for the sake of argument. This is an unlimited support uh, capability that we offer to our users over phone, email, remotely, or through chat. It um, includes all the software updates, so the equivalent of what would traditionally call, be called uh, maintenance uh, in the product. And what it includes also is the automatic updating of the budget rates, the tax rates, the NI contribution, all of the different elements that normally, at the beginning of the year, you need to update into your own SPS uh, environment. That's something that's handled uh, for you through uh, the system. And also the email service that I mentioned uh, earlier. And all of those services are included in that one um, full-time um, uh, fee or subscription fee. Okay, now I think one thing which is particularly important is to understand who our target audience was when we developed Indigo. Essentially, Indigo was designed with you guys in mind. Because you guys are the people who are running the payroll, issuing the pay slips, or monitoring the reports, generating or reading the reports. It's the people in this room who actually are the users of the payroll who have the most friction. Friction in terms of organizational and operational friction. So what we have done is we've <coughs> we've tried to ensure that we reduce the time to payroll, as I call it. The amount of time that it takes, the amount of effort that it takes to process um, a payroll. That's something which is particularly important for the people in this room. One of the ways that we do that, as we'll be seeing in a moment, is the reduction of staff requests to what I call HR. The reason I say what I call HR, there are many of you in this room that actually have HR departments that do this. Thanks, Rick. That have HR departments that do this, but some of you are really HR departments of one, or the people who are just running the payroll in a smaller company. So I use the term uh, broadly. But reducing the requests, reducing people coming up to you and saying, can you give me a copy of my FS3? Or why have you, uh, why does my um, uh, payslip show a tax deduction of 123.56 euros today, when normally I would expect that it would be something less. These are the types of things that you guys will be receiving, not necessarily day to day, but certainly whenever you process uh, your payroll. And you understand that pain better uh, than I do. So it's all about reducing process friction. But at the same time, it's also about improving the employee experience through providing a self-service capability for employees to be able to get their own pay slips, to be able to understand who is on leave on which day when they are planning their own leave so as not to clash with other people in their own uh, department. Equally, there's the improvement of the auditing that we provide within the system. Again, this auditing being increasingly important in the whole GDPR uh, discussion. And I, by the way, will be coming to a slide specifically about GDPR uh, in a moment. So, what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually take you through some of uh, these elements that I've spoken about to understand where we stand in terms of the, uh, the capabilities. So here we're working live um, on the system, so we're not working on um, a demo uh, in here. And what I also need to do is, there we are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off here down the left-hand side. Obviously the objective, by the way, before I go further, this isn't a training session. Part of the migration process is the provision of training, but I just want to highlight some particular points. So here what we've got is our dashboards and uh, the payroll processing and the calendaring uh, side. And I'd just like to start off having a look at the uh, employees. So just to be clear, we're working live on the system uh, at the moment in our demo uh, environment, which is obviously um, uh, a hosted uh, environment. So here what we're seeing is that we've maintained 
the, um, the user interface concept of mimicking Excel. Essentially, we have believed in grids as being the most effective way to present the data to our uh, users. And in doing this, what we do is we provide you with a range of different capabilities, obviously. And here, what I've got, apart from along the tab, uh, along the top, various tabs which allow me to drill in to specific information of the employee that I'm currently highlighting. Obviously, what I have, as I have with SPS, the idea that if, for instance, I just type in the word John, because you may have noticed the name column was highlighted in um, uh, a teal color, what has happened is it's come up with any employee that contains the word John. If I reduce that to J-O, it's going to come up with any name beginning, sorry, containing um, uh, J-O. If at the same time, what I want to do is I want to look only the J-O's in the food department, then what I've done now is I've got J-O in the name, I've got food in the department field, which is allowing me to search very effectively across different um, uh, areas or different fields. So as I said, the whole idea is not to be trained here, but to give you an idea of uh, the capabilities. So that's just one area related to, uh, to that. Obviously, as I do within um, uh, SPS, I have the capability to change my so search order across any of uh, these fields, so any of the fields, any of the columns can be searched upon. In addition, what I can do is I can actually choose which fields I want to show within my data. So these are the ones which are currently showing. If, for instance, I wanted to add the date of birth, um, what will happen is as soon as I click on this, you will notice in a second that, oh, sorry, there, um, that I've intentionally left some space at the far right hand side, as soon as I choose um, to add the date of birth and I apply, the date of birth will be added as a column to my field. If I want to move my date of birth further to the left, then all I need to do is that and drop it wherever I want to see it. And these are all personal settings, which what I can do, if I choose to, I can save that preference by clicking on this option here which will save that so the next time I come into this grid, I will see it with this uh, modification. I'm not, not going to be doing that uh, for the moment. Another thing when talking about the um, filtering um, data, which I think is particularly interesting, is this concept here of what we refer to as the filtering toolbar. Now, what this has given me is a capability and I'm going to just show you here three different areas that I can use for additional filtering on the right-hand side. So, for instance, you will notice that on the far top right, what it's actually saying is um, I've got the system filter active this year, which is currently lit. So what that means is any employee, including terminated employees, that were active this year, are or were active this year, are currently showing. So, for instance, here, I've got this particular employee, Borg Stephen, that was actually um, terminated in February of this year. If instead I choose active today, what it's going to do is it will actually show me only the ones which are active uh, today. So, the ones which are currently not terminated. Equally, <coughs> if I had various people who reported to me, um, I click on my staff, it will show me the active today of my staff. In my case, everyone's reporting um, uh, to me over here, so it's not showing uh, much uh, difference. Equally, however, it's possible to set up personalized filters, and I've got two filters already created here. One called Basic Bay is greater than 2,000, and another one is called Part-Timers, and if I were to click on any of those, it will filter yet again. So here what I've got is those which are active today and that have a salary over um, uh, 2,000 a month, and here 
are the salary levels and Matilda Gatt is doing well with an 80,000 salary over there. Okay? Is she in the room? <laughs> um, now we've also got this other bit down at the bottom right called tags, which I'll come back to at a later stage, which is actually a very useful um, capability, which I'll be talking about um, uh, later. Okay? So, um, the other capabilities that we have are things like copying and pasting an employee. So, very often you might have an employee, the characteristics, you might have a new employee, the characteristics of whom are identical to another employee, or almost identical to another employee. Obviously, not in terms of their social security number, or their address, or anything like that, but in terms of their grade, their department, maybe their pay scales, all of this type of stuff. And what you can do is you can copy and paste from one employee to another, and what's particularly interesting is that you can do that across companies. So those of you who are working in a multi-company environment, a group of companies, I'm seeing Patrick um, uh, over there, you can actually sometimes find transfers being done from one company to another for operational reasons, and you have the ability to just um, move them from one to another. Obviously, they still appear under the old company, terminated up to the date when you, um, uh, when you transfer. So that's particularly important. Now, there's also the capabilities of importing and export, which are very important. So, for instance, here, I'm going to start off looking at the export capabilities. So what the export capabilities do here is that you have the capability even more um, deeply than you have within SPS as far as exporting out to Excel. Because what you've got here is the ability to choose the specific fields that you want to export out of this particular file. So this is the employee file. So what we've got is all the fields which are shown uh, here. And you can export them out to Excel um, in a very simple process. Just click on export there to run the process. And it's now giving me the capability to export. Let me put that on my desktop and click on save. So there I've got my Excel spreadsheet and down at the bottom there's a link, you might not be seeing it, that you can click at the bottom there, there's an icon of Excel and the file name and size which I can click on and uh, open. Now that's obviously very important, and you have that capability throughout. So it's not just the employee details, you have this in the payroll reports, you have it in uh, a whole set of different areas within uh, the system. The other thing that you can do is, uh, actually while I'm explaining this, let me open this up. Okay, So here's all my data, well formatted, that I chose to uh, export. Once you've got it in Excel, of course, you can do with that whatever you would like to from an operational standpoint, point of view. Don't forget GDPR, where are you going to store that? Be careful because you have an obligation, this is your obligation, not our obligation, to actually store that in an appropriate manner in conformity with your policies and processes and for a time duration which has been uh, defined based on your policies. GDPR doesn't say you can only hold it for 30 days. GDPR says you need to decide what is appropriate and then you need to stick to that. You need to be clear uh, with, uh, with that. Okay, now the other thing that's important here is that I can also uh, use this for importing data. Now, when you come to importing data, you can do that in a number of ways. For instance, one of the things you can do is you could export your employee details, make a change in Excel by doing some calculations on Excel, and upload the data back. The system will understand which data has been up, updated, and it will update that within, uh, within here. That's fine. A different way of using the upload capabilities that you find throughout is in respect of areas like overtime. When you're working on overtime, yes, you can go onto an employee's record and feed in the overtime for this month, but more likely you'd have an Excel file which contains your overtime data that you want to upload in bulk. And that's obviously something that you can do. The issue there is making sure that the format of the Excel file you use is correct. And for us to help you in this way, when we click on the export option, 
what we also have is the ability, wherever we're doing this from, to generate the template. And generate the template will just generate a, um, an empty or almost empty Excel file. When I open it up, what it shows me is just the different columns which are available within Excel that could be populated for uploading. But what we also do is in the tab down at the bottom called Template Info, down at the bottom of Excel, we also give you an explanation of all the fields that are in that particular context so that you can understand what that field is used for, whether it's mandatory or not, what the options available for that field. Always, again, to reduce the process uh, friction, as I said. Okay? Now, as far as the tabs are concerned, we've got a number of tabs here which go into more detail. The whole concept is to try and have as much of the information which is available through one screen rather than in multiple places. And we've got elements like the pay items or the tax related to a particular employee. Let me choose one that I know has uh, a certain amount of uh, data on it. So, for instance, I've got the basic pays related to that employee. Now, what's interesting here is what I referenced about the end-of-year process. There is no end-of-year. So, when I'm looking at the history of the pay that this particular employee has been paid, what I've got is the whole history which can go as far as I need or want to keep that data. Again, within the provisions of GDPR. So here what I'm seeing is the history of the changes related to this. Equally, if I looked at the leaf history, I'm going to see the leaf history of Joe Borch across the multiple years that they've been operating on. Okay? So the idea of the tabs is to provide more information related to the currently highlighted um, uh, employee and to do so in an easy to access manner. In all these cases, uploading or downloading via Excel, as I just showed you in the employee master data, applies throughout uh, the, whole, uh, the whole system. Okay? Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, go into one of these uh, employees. Let me actually choose uh, Joe Borch as an example here. We seem to always use uh, uh, use him. And obviously here what we've got is the data related to the, uh, the detailed data related to the employees. One of the things you can do from here is you can squash down all of the data into the sections which are contextually sensitive to the operation itself. So here, rather than just having lots and lots of data all related to this one employee, what we can do is we can open up and shrink uh, that data. What we've got, obviously, is additional fields that you don't have in SPS. Many of these fields are in SPS, but there are a number of additional fields. Of particular importance is the cost center. Um, when we look at the structure that you're used to in SPS today, department, section, and unit, which still exists, and I'll come back to how we've improved the process of maintaining that. Sometimes what happens is your finance team will want one structure and your operational team will want a different structure. So what we've done is we've introduced the concept in addition to the department, section and unit of a separate and distinct uh, categorization through the cost center. And the linkage between the accounting costs related to the payroll and the Sherburn financial manager, because the integration with Indigo is also in place, of course, for the Sherburn financial manager, is linked, it's tied to that specific uh, cost center, giving you operational and financial visibility on the data. The other thing which is useful is I've got a little information button up at the top over here. So in the top right of the screen, a little eye. If I turn that 
on, then what I can do as I hover over the fields at the very bottom, I will get an explanation of the specific field. Here, the screen is actually, um, uh, this, what's it called, this panel is coming slightly in the way, but down at the bottom, there's an explanation of what that field contains and what, what it needs to uh, contain. Okay, that's with the uh, field help uh, capability. The other thing that I want to come back to is I mentioned tagging earlier when we were looking at filtering. If we look at this particular employee, I can unpin certain data, and what I see from here is some data related, some additional data related to this employee. So one of the things that I'm seeing are what are called the tags. And here I've got two tags, Project X and Exec Team. What are they? Well, those are what we call the tags. Sometimes what might happen is I'm uh, implementing a project within my company, and I need a couple of people from the development team, three people from the support team, and someone from accounts, and another two people from testing on that project. What I can do is I can tag those people. They're not all in the same department, or in the same section, or in the same unit. These are cross-functional groupings. And what I can do is I can tag those employees with a tag name. And that's what I've done over here, Project X. Or I've tagged those who are members of the exec team. Because they may be in the exec team, but they're actually within this department and perform the function of the exec team. And the way that you create a tag on an employee is very straightforward. If I go into the Add Tag field at that particular point, all I need to do is indicate that this person is on Project uh, Dynamite. 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 And suddenly, that person is also on the Project Dynamite uh, team. So here, what we have is the capability to have additional access. I've also got the ability to add attachments relating just to this employee. So here I'm not talking about corporate policy documents, but I'm talking about a copy of their contract. I'm talking about a copy of their CV. Documents which relate to this individual. And these documents, when added, can be added either that they are visible by the employee and available to the employee through the portal that I'll be describing later, or they could be locked. So although they relate to that employee, available to the employee. For instance, an assessment form, which you may or may not choose to share with the employee. What I've also got is some audit information related to the employee down at uh, the bottom and changes related to the employee, or the ability to add remarks and comments um, uh, about that particular employee. So all of these capabilities are available uh, within the system. By the way, there's also a little thing there called watchers and start watching. What you can do is you can actually say, I want to watch the, um, uh, the record of people in my team or some people in my team. And then what would happen is that if there's been any change to the data related to any of those people that you are watching, you will receive a notification through the notification options up at the top that something has changed in respect of any of the employees that you are currently watching. Again, it's all about making the process easier um, uh, for you. The other thing that we've got is the, uh, that we still have, I should say, but enhanced in its visibility, is the field level audit. Again, part of the whole compliance process it's very useful that any changes are logged, are maintained within the system that that particular field previously related to that employee um, was changed um, to a specific value. So if, for instance, I'm looking here, this is a, hus a historic change of the data related to this particular employee called John Borch. Okay? Now, we use John Borch very often to 
enter the data, so many of the changes about John Borch are made by John Borch uh, in this particular case, but it's showing you who has made the change, when that change has been made, and what the change uh, was from and to. So it shows you the field value as it was prior to the change and the field value after the change. You need to establish a policy as far as GDPR as to how long you want to create, maintain this data and then your role is to actually impose or ensure compliance with that particular policy. As I said earlier, GDPR is not going to say to you you need to keep this for 30 days or 15 days or for 100 days. It is the business need and, um, uh, that regulates this, but you should only keep data that is necessary. Is that a good assessment, Antonio? Okay. Il uomo del monte ha detto sì. Okay. So, um, right. So, um, just moving on. This, this is something which um, is a favorite uh, of mine, which is what we call the package um, uh, comparison. So, if, for instance, I were to pick John Borch as an example, and I'm doing some sort of salary evaluation, what I can do is I can pick John Borch, and I can use the package comparison, and it will give me a summary of his current package. But what I can also do is I can clone John Borch and actually say, as at 01, 01 of 2017, what was his package? And I can clone him again and say, I want exactly the same thing for 16 and maybe for 15. So here what it's doing is it's showing me John Borch's package as it is evolved in this case, over the last four years, giving me the tools to allow me to make my assessment. Now, you may say, is the payroll clerk going to do this? It doesn't have to be the payroll clerk. This could be the HR people. It could be whoever you choose to give access to this group of data. It doesn't mean that they have to have the rights to run the payroll, but to be able to have access to the payroll data, if I'm a manager and understanding the people who are paid under my, in my team, how their pay has evolved, this is a tool that allows me to do so uh, very easily. But I can also take this one step further. Do you, do you like this feature? Useful? Good? You can clap, by the way, if you like something. Okay? <laughs> now, if you like that, what you can also do is you can actually say, okay, we need to actually um, look at John Borch compared to all the other people in the exec team, or it could be these following people. Okay, so I've selected three other people as well as John Borch, and if I do that, it's going to compare the package of John Borch to each of those other three people that I chose. This is looking at parity within roles across um, uh, across the company. So it's showing me here that um, Wilfred or Ajus is on a package which is 13.51% higher, whereas Shea Camilleri is 9.51 uh, and uh, below, and David Caruana is 2.91 uh, above. By the way, this data is all fictitious. Um, any similarities in names of people that you know um, are purely coincidental. So again, this is very, very useful for that type of um, evaluation um, uh, function. So, um, what I'd like to do, uh, actually, before, before I go away, what I can also do from here is, do you remember I had used the filtering before? If I do now want to have a look at all the people who are on Project Dynamite, I can click on the Project Dynamite tab, in, or tag, rather, in the far right-hand side, and what has happened now is the data that is shown is just those people who are on Project Dynamite, which, of course, will allow me then to select them all and also do my salary comparisons across all the people on that project or all the people in the exec team. Whatever your grouping, your cross-functional grouping is within, uh, within the company. Again, we're talking about reducing process uh, friction. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to 
move off from here and go and have a look at the payroll processing um, uh, aspects. So like we've had within SPS, there is a concept of a payroll, and a payroll would typically be monthly or four-weekly or uh, two-weekly or weekly, and obviously you'd have mixes of all of those. In this case, they all uh, seem to be monthly uh, payrolls, and I'm seeing the current year payroll um, over here. But of course, what I could do is I could not just look at the current year payroll, but I could look at all the payrolls historically. Why is this important? Because some of you are going through the process trying to pick up data related to the payroll of June of last year against June of this year, or March of last year, or March the pre previous three years for the same uh, quarter. So this is part of the benefit of the removal of the end of year uh, process. But in practice, most of the time, it is just those payrolls which are in the current year that you're interested. Or maybe just the payrolls in the current year which are in progress, such as the April pro payroll of this year. So the concept of the payroll still exists, but of course what I can do is I can, across the top here, I've got tabs that allow me to utilize the data for updating certain data globally, such as the concept of global pay items. Pay items is the term in Indigo that replaces what previously were allowances and deductions. We now have a concept of what we call a pay item, anything that results in a person's pay being increased or decreased is referred to as a pay item. Pay items are of specific type. So you have a list of pay items to ensure that not everyone decides their own grouping, which makes comparisons and reporting uh, difficult. But the concept of the pay item is a fundamental component. The pay item will consist of the salary, the base salary for the base hours, but also overtime, car allowances, disturbance allowances, um, uh, payments for uh, overtime and, and, and things like that. So all of these can be entered directly from here. So if, for instance, you have a number of part-time employees, you'd probably go into the basic hours, and from there what you would do is you'd either enter the hours here, if you have a very small number, it might be easier, or you upload them for, um, uh, through Excel into uh, the system uh, directly. Okay? Every now and then I see a number of you looking at each other going, hmm, you know, that's going to save me some time. Um, that, that's exactly what it's, what it's about. The same thing with leave, overtime, uh, pay, it, um, uh, pay items themselves. Leave is there for the simple reason that whereas most companies would choose to implement the portal to allow employees to apply for leave, to have the leave authorized by their authorizer, um, there are situations particularly in industrial um, uh, uh, environments, where the employees are not given access necessarily to the uh, uploading of their own leave through a portal, either because th the way things work or it could be because the, um, the level of the staff is not deemed to be very computer-friendly to go and apply for leave online in that way. So that's why leave is there uh, in this place, but in practice, many most would actually use uh, the portal. If, by the way, I go into the payroll itself, what's going to happen is the system is going to show me the details as you have been used to in uh, SPS with three panels here in this case. One, the list of the employees. Two, the data related to the currently highlighted employee. In this case, it's Abdullah Zakari and at the far right-hand side, the details of their payslip. At the moment, this payroll hasn't been calculated, and therefore, there is no payslip um, uh, here uh, showing. So this is similar to what you're used to, although in uh, SPS it's in two panels. We've added the preview of the payslip on the right-hand side, the draft uh, 
um, of the payslip on the right-hand side. But the concept is everything to do with the calculation of the payroll is done from one screen. And you've got a workflow which guides you step by step through each of the processes. Now, in this particular case, Zachary Abdullah is a part-time employee, and you might have noticed when I went into the hours um, um, uh, screen, there were already some hours for his part-time hours that have been uploaded. But like in um, uh, SPS, when you have a full-time employee, you don't have any unusual hours, shall we call them, which are listed because it will use the default hours of that particular employee. But from here, I can also go to the overtime records, if there are any, or the pay items of that particular employee. So if I go on John, John Borch, whose payroll has been calculated, and here I've got a preview of his payslip, I'll come back to this in a second, I can look at any pay items, like he's got an allowance uh, of 80 euros, he's got a 10 euro contribution to Inspire, which I would recommend everyone implements within their company. We've got it operating at Sherbin for um, uh, quite some time now, and other types of uh, allowances, which are, uh, or deductions, in this case they're allowances. You'll also notice here, that's what that green tick mark is showing that the calculation for that particular employee has been calculated. You'll also notice that we've got the employee type here, and as usual, we can choose the column headings that are shown, we can choose the sort order, we can search, we can do all of that type uh, of, uh, of capability. Now, what I'm going to do at this particular stage is I'm going to run the payroll calculation for all the employees. So here, down at the bottom, I've got a number of icons. As I hover over each, it will tell me what the four icons do. The first one is to calculate an individual employee. The second calculates all the employees. The third deletes the calculation of one employee. And the fourth deletes the calculations of all the employees, in case you uh, want to rerun because you'd forgotten something or whatever it may be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click off the calculation process and what is happening at the moment is the system is picking up the standard hours from each employee who is working on a full-time basis to which are added any allowances, deductions, overtime, all of that type of stuff and what is happening is it will do the same thing for those which are working on a part-time um, uh, basis. From here, what I can do is I can now highlight any one of these and at the far right hand side I will see a draft of the payslip of the employee, including if for instance I were to look at overtime and click on the button, it will open up and show me that the amount of the overtime on this particular employee is made up of um, four hours at double time, three hours at time and a half, and it's showing me the individual rates and totals for that overtime. So this is something I can do well before the payroll comes to an end, make sure that I've got everything in line. In this particular case, we've got one which is not in line, and here what I've got is a warning. So we left that warning there to be able to bring up the details on the screen. It's not in red, but it, sorry, it's not in green, but you, you'll notice that it's a red exclamation mark. And when I highlight that red exclamation mark, it's showing me at the bottom that the payroll calculation for the employee code and the tax code already exists in the calculation in the tax credit. So here what has happened is the system is saying, hang on, you've got something duplicated in your tax credit. So that was put in there intentionally. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete John Borch, delete his calculation, that is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and recalculate, sorry, recalculate just John Borch. And now what I've got is the data is shown in green. So uh, I forgot to show you actually before this green bar actually had a little portion which was red, which represented the one employee on which there was a problem. Okay? And of course what you could do is you could filter on the state to bring up the list of the employees that have a problem, if you've got more than one, that's a very useful 
uh, way of dealing with it. Now here, my, green, my bar is all green. It's got a number 74. It's showing I've got 74 calculated. There are zero errors, zero pending, and the calculation is 100% ready. Technically speaking, if this was the end of the um, uh, month, what I can do is I can issue the payroll report and start to finalize issue, pay slips, etc., etc. But one of the things which I would typically want to do before doing that is generate the payroll report, which I do again from the same screen. I can generate the report as a totals report, or you can get what we call the gross totals or the detailed. I'll come back to the detailed in a moment. And as you're used to doing today, you can group this by company, by department, by employee code in three different levels of grouping. In addition, what you can do is you can highlight a specific set of analysis codes. You might be interested in saying, okay, but what's the maternity fund contribution? I want to highlight that in the report on its own. And what you can do in the basic standard report, you can just add that column. What the detailed report does is it will actually export to Excel and every single pay item has its own column. So that way, if you're interested in knowing what the value of contributions made for telephone allowances, you can have a telephone allowances column specifically with its own total. Obviously there you could have a mass of data, it wouldn't get onto a printer, and therefore we only export that out um, uh, to Excel. And from this report, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate this report. What the system does is it generates the reports into um, a PDF file. And what will happen is that PDF file gets opened um, uh, within the system itself. So here I'm seeing my payroll report. If you want to make it slightly bigger. Okay, just gives you an idea. Most of you will be fairly familiar. Um, uh, with this, uh, with this report uh, sort of layout, because obviously it's based on some fundamental details related to uh, the payroll itself. Okay, so um, what we can also do uh, from here is you can choose to send the report. What will happen in that particular case? It will give you the ability to choose the email address and any additional messages that you want to add with that report uh, being, uh, being sent out. Um, if uh, Chris is over here, Chris, does that actually send the PDF in the email or a link to the PDF? PDF. Okay, it sends the PDF out to um, the intended recipient. Now, the other thing which is uh, useful over here, if I were to look back at the report, so I've, I've got my, sorry, not the report, at the payroll calculations, one of the things that's particularly useful for me to do is to understand what my payroll costs are looking like uh, at the moment. So here, the concept behind this is to provide you with the ability to understand not only the history of your payroll costs over the historic months, each of those can be hovered over to see the line, the, the, uh, the values related to the different components. So here we're saying January 2018, the net amount, social, contribu social security contributions, tax, company SSC, and the maternity leave fund uh, contributions. So you can get a good feel of that. Here what we've got is the breakdown of the current payroll showing the component related to fringe benefits, to overtime, uh, leave, etc. This is how you are able to analyze. And this is the figure you have to look at. That figure down at the bottom right, that is when you do your payments, bank credits, checks, whatever it is, that's the amount of money going out of your bank account. So, before you issue the text, you've got to make sure you've got that cash in your bank. <laughs> okay? So the idea behind it is, again, reducing the friction in the process, just trying to make things um, uh, easier. Okay. So I'm now in the stage where I'm happy with the payroll and I'm going to finalize it. As you do today, I'm clicking on the finalize option here. As you do today, what actually happens 
is the finalizing artificially blocks you from making any change, changes post-finalization. I say artificially blocks because if you need to make changes, you can unfinalize, make the changes, as long as you're an authorized person, to unfinalize and make those changes and then refinalize. So it's controlling that process. That process has been maintained. Now I'm about to finalize, but what the system is doing here is it's giving me some warnings. These aren't errors. These are warnings. It's actually saying, it, it's noticed the payroll period, but it's saying John Borch, employee 0040, has pending leave awaiting for approval for the 12th of, um, of, uh, of June. In this case, Francesco Gallia has pending rave, um, leave of the 13th of April. Well, I'm paying for the April period. If I've got Francesco has applied for leave, but it's not yet been approved. I now have a choice. I can either go back to the department manager and say, listen, you've got this pending leave. Are you going to approve it or not? Because I need to issue the payroll for April. Even if we're now at the end of April, the pending leave was for a date which has already passed, but it hasn't been approved. Okay, and there may be a reason why it hasn't been approved. Now, at this point, you have the decision that you take. Do I actually wait for the approval cycle by that manager before issuing the payroll, or am I at a stage that I have to issue the payroll and I take a decision to run the payroll, it will not account for that leave, but it will account for the April leave in May, assuming it gets approved by May. Okay? So the idea here is to allow you flexibility, not block you, but also warn you of um, the process. So in my particular case, I'm running the finalization process and it's blocking my payroll. As soon as I've done that, you'll notice my icons have changed here. And the icons that I've got here are now taking me through a workflow. The first of which is the payslips. So if I click on the payslips option, what it will allow me to do is to download, print, or generate um, uh, the uh, payroll, uh, sorry, the payslips, or to publish the payslips. So what it's going to be doing at this particular point is generating out and printing out those payslips. But when I say printing out the payslips, what am I talking about? Am I talking about physically a printout? It depends on the setting that was applied to each individual employee. An employee can receive a printout can be flagged to receive a printout, can be flagged to receive a f an actual email in their email box, or can, be re um, uh, can receive an email containing a link to the payslip. And as we will see when we look at the portal, they have the ability to pick up their um, payslip from there. If I were to just show you this payslip, make it a bit bigger so you can see it more clearly. One of the differences we've done in the payslip is it is an A4 size. It's not a, um, uh, a slip uh, as such. And the reason that we've done that is to add additional information. Given that most people are going to be seeing this electronically, whether it's an A4 size or a small slip, doesn't save you paper um, as such. And uh, we thought that seeing the data or providing the data to the employee would be a lot more useful. Down the left-hand side, we've got sets of data related mainly to the demographics and certain details of leave balances, totals to dates, etc. And on the right-hand side, what we've got are the actual uh, payslip uh, itself of the various employees. Here, one which is a bit more of a complicated one, Willard Abela, so I'll show you that. And each time it's giving as much detail as possible, so as to avoid the employee coming back asking lots of questions from whoever's processing the payroll. This is available in the, or through the portal, and I will come back to this, because when we see it in the portal, you will also see that the employee will not only be able to see the payslip, but they'll be able to see the whole workings of the FSS. Because very often they say, oh, you've reduced too much tax, or why is this, why is that? You've got the whole explanation of the methodology behind the workings. And the FS5, sorry, FS3, 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 FS3 
uh, of that uh, particular um, person. So I'll come back to this point at a later stage. Equally, what I can do from here, again as part of the workflow, is I can go through the process of generating the, um, the bank uh, direct credits. So here, the system is configured to issue the payments all from one BOV account, but as you can with win SPS, obviously, you can have multiple accounts to pay different people through different accounts, although that's less of a, an issue. Uh, nowadays, and what I've got are the actual details of what would be generated into the file which is required, in this case for BOV or for HSBC. And uh, you can generate or regenerate that um, uh, straight through uh, the system. Obviously, it's a whole lot of googly gook, so there's not much uh, to see uh, at that point. And the final point of the process is the FS5. So again, here I've got the FS5 option. If I go through the process and preview the SF5, or, uh, so the FS5, um, what it's going to do is it's going to show me here, obviously, um, what happens in the issuing of the FS5. You've got the ability to fill in various details, like the check number uh, that's being uh, attached uh, to um, uh, to the payment going to the department. And that's what the FS5 uh, looks like. Obviously, no surprises over here. This is a statutory, uh, statutory form. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do now at this point is I'd just like to take you back to where we started and start to have a look at uh, this. This is what we refer to as the calendar, and obviously what you can do is you can choose the periods over which you view the calendar, and what the calendar is, is a mechanism which picks up from the system, from various parts of the system, different elements which have a date impact. So the first thing I'm seeing over here is I'm actually seeing a list of different types of elements that I can turn on or turn off. So for instance here, I'm seeing this particular element here, which is the work permit calendar. In fact, if I click on it, it will indicate to me, it's picked up from the employee record, that what happens is Michaela has a work permit which is due for renewal on the 26th of uh, April. And there are some messages um, that you have over here. So the idea is whoever's working on the payroll has the ability to view forward later this month, next month, two months time, to have a look at what actions need to be taken now which are going to impact what's happening in the future. And of course what I can do is turn on and off these. So if I turn on the uh, leave calendar for instance, it will superimpose as an event people's leave. But that might clutter up my calendar, and it's not so important for me as the payroll operator, so I can turn it off again. Or I might, might want to look at the probation, who's on probation, whose probation expires, and when it expires. You can turn this on and off as you choose. There are a selection of different calendars. So you've got a contract expiry, employee anniversary calendar, very important, al pasti, so they can make sure that you get cannoli as they can warn them in advance. <laughs> Birthdays, holiday calendar, so public holidays, the leave calendar, individual people's leave calendar, um, which are superimposed on, on top of this. What's also interesting, of course, here, is that what I can do is I can say, ah, but only show me those people related to the food department, because that's my department. So don't show me the calendar of everyone, in fact, I might not already have been able to see the calendar of everyone, but I'm only interested in the food department. So suddenly, the food department or the admin department calendar comes up based on the different elements. Again, process friction reduction. That's what this element uh, is, uh, is about. Okay. No, there we go. Now, what I'd now like to go to is the employee dashboard. So this is what we've seen so far, your end users 
may or may not have access to. The reason I say may or may not have access is that you may choose that your line managers have access to the employee details with salary packages of the employees that are within their uh, uh, um, uh, area of influence. So that's why I say may or may not. But this is something that unless you're in an industrial environment where you choose not to provide this to the end employees of an industrial nature, or of course it could be that in the canteen you put a couple of machines that people can apply for leave um, in a centralized uh, way rather than through their own system. But this is typically how most users interact with the system. So what I'm seeing here, first of all, is a widget-based design. So here, for instance, each of these is a widget. If I pick up my own profile, I can choose where I want to place that. I can move these around to accommodate my own uh, requirements. I can add or remove the widgets that I'm interested uh, in. In this particular case, the, um, uh, the thing which is important about the widget is that the objective that we're trying to achieve here is increased productivity, particularly reducing the load on the payroll team, HR department, whatever uh, situation that you're in. So the concept behind it is self-service, giving people the ability to do things on their own at a time which is uh, convenient. So what am I seeing here? Well, first of all, at the top right-hand side, this is more, by the way, about me. It's not about so much the organization. Before, I was seeing all the employees, all the payroll, all this department. This is about me as a user. I'm John Borch. I'm logged in as John Borch, and this is what I see. On the top right-hand side, it's showing me my leave balances status. So we've got over here, either in hours or in days, if I click on these, I've got, for instance, vacation leave, 18 days left in 2018. 144 hours of leave have not yet been availed of. I've also got one day left of study leave, and I've got two and a half days of blood donation leave. You can choose what leave elements get displayed here. Um, to make it easy for you to operate. You also see here some color coding. And the color coding, the blue over here that I'm highlighting, when I highlight it, it's actually saying, and it's probably difficult for you to read, but it's saying upcoming leave 48 hours. So here it's saying to you, you've taken a certain amount of leave, but you've actually got 48 hours already planned to be taken. So it's not taken yet, but you have booked it. We're also seeing where you are in the process. What do I mean here? Well, we're now in April. We're in week, who knows the week numbers that we're in. I don't follow week numbers. 16? Guess? Let's assume we're in week 16. So by week 16, given that you're meant to take your leave entitlement over the span of the year, from a legal perspective, you as an employer can enforce that, it's particularly important to know where you are compared to where you should be. Let me use the term should be at this particular point. And that is important for two reasons. One, because you don't want people to accumulate their leave all at the end of the year. But two, also, because if you've got people who have taken leave ahead of time, in other words, they've taken the equivalent of half their year's leave when they're only at the end of the first quarter, if they choose to leave the company, you cannot claw back the leave that they have taken should they actually be terminated beforehand. So keeping an eye on that, depending on the policy on the cover in the company, is an important issue. But it's also important for you to see it in, um, in respect of your own leave. But I can also see it in respect of my team. So here what I've got is this is a widget which only shows me those people who report to me. So it's showing me here, again, either in hours or in days, the actual leave situation for all those people that have 
um, uh, that report to me. Again, this is to ensure that you don't end up with a large number of people at the end of the year wanting to take leave and uh, all of this uh, sort of stuff. What I can also do from here is I can see my own leave pl planner. So this is showing me the leave that I've got planned out for um, at least the next two months, and I can choose for how long I want to see uh, that data. And these are color-coded. So this is out of office, which I'll come back to in a moment, whereas this one is actually sick, full pay, whereas this is actual normal vacation uh, leave. Now, we spoke about the issue of out of office. What do I have uh, uh, over here? Well, first of all, I have a widget that we call out of the office, which is slightly different to out of office. So what's the concept of out of office? You are all out of the office today. I'm assuming that no one booked a day on morning's leave to come here today because you're here on company business. But it's important for people to know that you are out of the office because you need to not be disturbed. You're not going to be around. Another concept is working from home. Increasingly important. When you're working from home, it's important for people to know that you're not there, not because you're on vacation or sick or whatever. You are available, but just happen to be working from home. So that's a different uh, distinction. And here what I've got is a list of the people who are out of the office at the moment. Now, when I say the people, it's up to you to decide the granularity of the data that is shown. One of the points that came up both in Antonio's talk and also Jonathan is it's your data. It's not our data. So you have to implement policies. We need to give you the tools to implement those policies to allow you to say, well, you know what? I want the line manager of the production department only to see who is out of the office in his own department. That is a choice that you make in accordance to your own business needs and in accordance to your own policy. Indigo is not going to impose anything on you. We give you the tools to allow you to implement your policy. And that's the distinction. And this is back to the data processor and data controller uh, sort of argument. But here what I'm seeing is three people in this particular case. Caruana David is marked as out of office. George Ajus is marked as on sick leave today, and he's got a red flashing uh, cross. And Malia Josette is on uh, vacation. And it also shows the uh, estimated date um, uh, back when it's more than one day. Now, in a moment, I'll come back to the idea of why George Ajus is actually flashing there. But what I want to show here is this box, which is actually the authorization process. So here what it's doing is it's saying that there are four requests from either four people, or it could be two people with multiple requests, for, um, for, for vacation leave, which are awaiting my approval. And if I hover on it, it will show me who the four people uh, are. If I click on that, what it's going to do is it's going to bring up the people who are awaiting my approval for leave. Why are, they await why, is it why are they awaiting my approval? Because in the organizational chart, which I will show you shortly, they are listed as people who report to me. So, their requests have come to me. If I was on leave on the day when they made a request, and therefore I was not in a position to authorize their leave, it will actually go to the next person up in the reporting chain. Okay? So that is all handled in the system. The important thing here is that if I highlight, for instance, George Ajus, not only is it showing me the detail of George Ajus, so he's on uh, or hoping to go on uh, vacation leave, there's a little comment that he might have added over there. For instance, here is just saying car service. Sometimes it's saying traveling. So when you're approving people's leave, if you're approving people's leave for someone who's traveling rather than someone who's doing a car service, maybe you might um, choose uh, uh, to allow one, not another. Because the, bi the business of allowing someone or not is very important. When I highlighted George, what it actually did was it showed me, when I highlighted George, that there's someone else, John Borch, me in this case, in the same department as George, who is also on vacation on that day. So here what we're seeing is, or what we're doing is we're providing the visibility to the person who is authorizing to know who else in that department is on vacation leave because it should influence 
your decision as to whether to authorize or not authorize. Of course, these are all date and time stamped, so you know the order in which they've come in. So if you have a policy saying who applies first um, um, uh, gets the leave, then you can uh, keep track of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to appro approve George's uh, email, and I'm going to click, sorry, not the email, his request. I'm going to click on submit, and that's actually gone off my list. So now George will receive an email from the system saying that I have approved his leave, and he will also have a file attachment, which is what's called an ICS file format, which if they double-click on that, it will automatically create the leave in their calendar, if they're using a calendar uh, system. So the whole idea behind it is to manage uh, this process. This is a very, very important process because currently, particularly in a larger company, the process of applying for leave, getting authorization, etc., etc., is able to take quite a lot of effort and consume, uh, consume time. By the way, if I was George's authorizer for his leave, I would receive the email um, saying, when, when he applied, I would have received the email in my uh, inbox, which, if I was using an iPhone or an Android phone, I could actually select it, log in um, uh, to Indigo on my iPhone or Android phone to approve the leave uh, request. So the idea behind it is to provide that mobility to not be in a situation where, when someone's out of the office, they're blocked from the process uh, itself. Now, the other thing I'd like to do, if I keep going down here, there are lot, lots of widgets which you may or may not put in. You've got leave situation reports, leave history reports. I've got access to corporate documents within the system, like policies, procedures. I've got my own attachments, which are visible uh, here. The attachments that have been entered into the system, like it could be my evaluation, if I've got authorization to see it, or it could be um, my latest CV, whatever it is. What I've also got here is the payslip. So rather than having to go back to the, IT to the HR department to ask for the payslip, a copy of the payslip, however long ago, I can click on it and up will come uh, the payslip, which from here I've got all the details which are necessary from that payslip. If I, this is giving me the preview, what I can also do, I can go to the actual workings details. So here, this is, the issue of saying, well, how did the system deduct X amount of tax rather than Y? Okay, providing, pushing this out to the employee to be able to provide um, uh, access to this information to them, including the FSS calculation, the whole workings behind the SSS, FSS uh, categories. There's a complex structure of how the FSS is calculated and it's showing you all the deductions, how they've been done according to these rules. Again, part of the self-service idea. Okay, now I need to, yeah. So here, what we're talking about, the 24, uh, um, uh, 24 by 7 and the various aspects of the employee portal. So, I spoke about the organizational charts. Um, if I... Go here. Okay. What I get here is the organizational chart. The organizational chart is used to allow you to define the reporting structure in a very tangible, very easy to do way. And what you can do is you can shrink it or um, uh, increase it. What you can also do is you can click on a particular level in the chart, it will expand to that level, and here it will show the individual people. So here what I'm seeing is that any of these people whose names you probably can't see at the back, but these are individual names of people, they all report to Lawrence Margri. Lawrence Margri is the person who would um, authorize the leave of any of the people um, in this list. But equally, Lawrence is authorized by Francesco Gallia. 
And the beauty behind this is, of course, that you will have situations where people move. So, for instance, if I look here, these are all of the same department, so I don't need to, but let, uh, let me pick an example. Ah, okay, here, here's one. So, you notice they're all color-coded because of the departments that they're in, and I'm seeing that Marceline Grec is actually currently reporting to Josette Malia, but because I can see from her color here, she should be reporting to George uh, Ajus. So here, all I need to do is click on Marceline Grec, drag her onto George Ajus, and suddenly what we've got is the structure for the reporting and authorization is modified. If I decide that actually Ronnie Grec should then also report to Marceline, as should Peter Jones, as should Harvey, uh, Harvey Peresso, then that's how that moves. If I choose to move Marceline under, um, sorry, wrong one, under, hang on, I'm pressing the wrong button here, bear with me a second, there we go. Um, if I move Marceline Grec underneath Josette Malia, what will happen is Marceline plus her reports would all move under Marceline. So the idea here is to ensure that it's easy to set up the structure and that it's easy to move people from a, uh, one element in the organization uh, to, uh, to another. Okay? We are right with that? So, I want to now, as I get closer to winding down, um, I want to just um, address the issue of uh, security. You're all familiar to the access control model that we've got in SPS. So the basic concept is users are put into groups. A group is allocated the right to, or possibly different levels of rights, to different what we call secure functions. In doing so, automatically when you create a user and put them into a group, they inherit all the rights and limitations of that group. Now, we've maintained that structure within SPS. However, we've taken it further to also introduce the concept of what we call roles. And roles are given rights or limited from having access to certain rights. And users can be allocated to more than one role. So it could be that the Project X team need to be given specific rights independently of the level within the organization they are. So in addition to having the user rights, you have the concept of roles. Roles are given rights. Any user who is allocated that role give, is given the rights of that role. Should you have a conflict between roles, in other words, you're a member of two roles, each of which has different levels of rights to the same function, you will inherit the rights of the highest role um, that you belong to. So this is something which is um, uh, important. The other thing which is very important is filtered data access. So currently, what you've got is very often you have an organization that wants to have a management payroll separate from a, um, uh, the rest of uh, the team because of confidentiality. And typically the way that that is done is by having two payrolls and either combining them under one PE, um, oh, not either, that's the way it's done, that they're combined, combined under one PE for FS. Um, um, uh, reporting, uh, etc. You don't need to do that any longer because within the system you can have access to what we refer to as filtered data um, access. So you can say Tony has access to Malta International Airport but not to Skypox PLC, even though they're in the same environment. Okay? So the concept of separate P PE numbers is not uh, required. Obviously, if you choose to continue to do that, that's an option, but you certainly don't have to. Where it gets more interesting, if you ask me, is giving filtered access to a particular department to a line manager, which today has been an issue. So here, what you'd be able to do, as Patrick was asking, is to provide to the QA manager 
access to the data related to all the staff who report uh, uh, to them. Not necessarily to run the payroll, but to have limited access to certain uh, data. So that can be done by company, by government. There are a bunch of different capabilities there. I mentioned already the pay slips through the portal to reduce the possibility that your IT administrator who has access to your mail system suddenly has access to the pay slips of uh, the staff. This is quite a, uh, uh, an important issue. We've also implemented dual factor authentication. So what we're talking about is that if you have a particularly secure environment, we've implemented this for instance in banks, if you have a particularly secure environment, what you might want is not just to log in, but as soon as you log in or attempt to log in, the system will send you either via email or a text message, it will send you a code that you need to apply to be able to then go into the second stage of authentication. Okay? This can be a bit of a nuisance for people, so um, uh, uh, sometimes you say, oh God, do I have to do this again? But that's what security is about. It's much more convenient not to have a door which locks, but just to be able to walk in and out, security comes with a price. The point is, you choose when to apply it. So for instance, you may say, what I want to do is impose dual factor authentication for these following three people, because those are the three people who have the access to the highest grade of information. You choose. Okay? Um, yeah, the other thing, um, and again, Antonio um, uh, brought up, not only that you need to be compliant, but you have to be seen to be being compliant. So we also need to be seen to be doing the best we can to ensure that we protect your data, because it is your data. And um, we um, have run penetration uh, testing, uh, most recently was actually uh, last month, we got the report uh, two days ago, three days ago, something like that. Um, so this is something where we hire an independent company to um, uh, do a test to try and penetrate into our system. So this is something which is done at considerable expense, I will add, but it's very important for us to make sure that the way that we've configured the system is doing the absolute utmost to ensure the security of your data. Um, and of course, we had the talk from Jonathan this morning which spoke about the Azure level of security. This was, as I mentioned earlier, one of the prime reasons that we decided not to host this internally. We have capabilities to host this internally. We have um, a 24-7 environment. We've got a whole, uh, whole uh, set of capabilities, but we didn't think that that was enough. We need to be able to um, uh, ensure that quality of not just security in terms of access, but reliability and availability of systems. By the way, at the bottom of the system, there is a little icon here, which looks like a pulse. If you click on that icon, what it will actually do is it will show you the availability of the system over the last 31 days. This is actually showing that the system over the last 31 days has been available for 99.902% of the time. So it's actually been a total of 43 minutes over the last 31 days that the system uh, was not available. Usually because we'll be doing some sort of update uh, on the system. This is again back to the idea of transparency. We have a commitment in our contract to maintain a level of availability and in that contract, if we don't meet those terms, there are conditions under which we have to give you a refund. So this is something we keep an eye on, and you can keep an eye on this yourselves. So wanting to be transparent with this information uh, for you. Okay. Um, so, uh, too many things in my hand. So, Microsoft Cloud, reliability, security, redundancy, this, this whole point. Scalability, very important. How have, we be, how have we been able to ramp up our users so quickly? You know, there are times in the morning where you might have eight, 9,000 users logging into the system in the same hour, okay? To have a system like that, you require great scalability. In the system itself, it's designed so that if there's an upsurge of users in the system, 
what the system will do, it will set up more memory. It will automatically set up additional servers if we need to, what's referred to as horizontal and vertical scaling. This is all stuff that we inherit and built into the system. Now, I'm coming to the end, um, and um, I just want to address the issue of time and attendance. Because time and attendance, we've done some attendance capabilities within the system. So already, what you can do is if you've got things like an Excel spreadsheet with people's punching that you want to load up into the system, you can do so. We handle that, we integrate it into the system, and that's fine. But obviously, we're looking at going further in terms of a full time and attendance system on the level which is used by larger companies, generally speaking. And there are people in this room, Patrick, I was speaking to you, who are actually waiting to go on to Indigo when this capability is um, uh, available. So what do we actually do with this? Well, the first thing we did was we hired someone to do a third-party assessment. So we actually hired someone to look at what we do in SPS today and to look at what's out there on the market, and I'm not talking about the local market only, I'm talking about the uh, wider market, to look at what the state of play is. And what we did was we um, identified that each of the systems that we were evaluating had something outstanding, but none of them had everything outstanding. They all, this one had this bit which was good, but a bit weak there. This other one had something else which was good, but something weak uh, elsewhere. So what we've decided to do is we've put all of that together, and we're in development. This is actually one of the screenshots from the rostering screen of the system of the TNA module, which will be the, um, the Indigo uh, TNA uh, module. And the capabilities of this will go significantly beyond, especially in terms of usability, the TNA um, uh, product that we currently have, which is actually market leading in Malta already in any case. So it's always a bit uncomfortable crashing down what is the market leading product, but it's back to the strategy and courage and financial strength that I mentioned uh, earlier. So this is something that we're working on uh, currently. We've got a plan for a minimum viable product to be available, to be looked at and tested by uh, core customers in October 2018, October of this year. And what we've done is we've opened up a capability on our website. If you actually go and have a look at the time and attendance page under Indigo, which will allow you to sign up if you're interested to be part of that MVP process. So um, those of you who want to contribute and comment uh, in that way will be uh, most welcome uh, to do so. And then um, we'll feed that into our development process. Okay, GDPR. We heard um, a lot from Antonio, but as he said, he could go on talking for a day on the subject. So just a few elements. We've been working on the GDPR side of things for uh, some while. Um, there are some basic principles that have already been stated but are worth restating, that it is your data, it's not our data. We can never and will never go through and find all the employees at a particular company and mail them something, um, uh, any of that sort of stuff. It is your data, it's not our uh, data. Uh, we, purvey, we provide the software and the environment, although we are not a payroll bureau. A payroll bureau would be the company that actually takes your raw data, processes the data, literally feeding in your actual data into the system, and giving you the output being the um, output from the payroll, pay slips, reports, etc., etc. So we're not a payroll bureau. Many of our customers do, prov customers do provide that capability. We're providing the software, the infrastructure. We're providing the means with which you uh, process uh, and, and run uh, the payroll. But from a contractual perspective, you are the data controllers. There's no doubt in terms of interpret interpretation, but we assume the responsibility as the data processor. So Indigo or Sherbin Software Limited is a data processor. 
in our indigo contracts. This is reflected within the contracts, and these contracts, thanks to Antonio's company, have been reviewed for their compliance with the obligations that we have and that you have as a data controller, and in our case, a uh, data processor. Equally, Antonio mentioned the important point that Microsoft are identified within that contract as a sub-processor, because we are using their um, environment and um, uh, capabilities. Now, there's some argument about this last point. What happens in SPS? It's clear enough in Indigo. In SPS, you are the data controllers, but you are using our software on your premises to run the payroll. However, there are times in which you might share with us your data as part of a support process. So in that context, we are also data processors when it comes to your SPS uh, environment. Okay? Obviously, we have an obligation, already we have had that obligation of confidentiality in respect of your data, but with the new um, uh, GDPR, our obligations increase in terms of data retention, in terms of our transparency with you as the data controller of what we do with the data that you provide to us to undertake um, uh, testing. Okay, so that, that's uh, that particular situation. So how are we going to regulate um, uh, this? I spoke about the data retention. Um, the payroll is slightly different. If, for instance, we had a situation that um, we were storing other types of data, in other words, data which isn't controlled by other laws, so, for instance, if you're looking at accounting or payroll data, there are obligations for the storage of data, even from the Inland Revenue Department and other government departments. So you can't have a situation where an employee, even in the right-to-be-forgotten scenario, comes to you as an employer and says, I want to be forgotten. Because he can't be forgotten because he is an employee of yours, and he continues to have a relationship with you which the payroll and the storage of that data is um, a necessary part of your relationship in that requirement. Antonio, yell if I'm saying something untrue. Okay? Um, it's unnerving having a lawyer in front of you when you're saying this stuff. <laughs> um, so, right to be forgotten in that context is pretty clear. But what happens when the employee leaves the company? Does he have a right to be forgotten having left the company? Well, you have an obligation to maintain records for your compliance with inland revenue, social security, etc., etc. So the argument there would be, no, he doesn't have a right to be forgotten in general of everything, but certainly the right to be forgotten of his medical records or his leave records or other records which are not necessary for the processing or the maintenance of your obligation as an employer to the government departments in, 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 um, uh, in question, that is something that is uh, a different issue. So what we need to do is we need to provide you with the platform to be able to conform in this way. So can you go into Indigo and delete the medical records of an employee? Answer yes. Can you go in there and delete the payroll calculation of two years ago? Answer no. Can you go on to the employee, having had that employee leaving the company, and mask the address or the phone number of that employee? Yes, you can go into, you've got these capabilities as part of the system. So what we do is we need to provide you with the capabilities to ensure that you have adequate means to meet your responsibilities of uh, GDPR. One of those responsibilities, so I've spoken about the right to be forgotten, Antonio mentioned that there is a legal obligation for us to define the relationship between the parties. Now, we already have that in existing agreements under SPS, of course, not in respect of GDPR, because GDPR did not exist. Our new contracts 
obviously, of indigo are um, addressing those needs, but we are assuming that not everyone is going to be able to migrate to indigo before the 25th of May. Certainly, if you do, it makes your GDPR compliant better, I have to say that, but you're not all going to be able to do it by the 25th of May. So what are we going to need to do? Well, what we're doing is we're preparing an additional agreement, which is a data processing agreement that we will be sharing with all of our clients. And I'm not just talking about our Indigo clients, I'm talking about all the clients of SPS, even uh, SFM, all of our products, and also those, those clients to whom we only provide services like network support. We don't have many of those. Um, that's not our core business. But we will be sending out to you, obviously in time for the uh, 25th of May, we will be sending to you an additional agreement which defines this relationship, as I have explained, and ensures that both you and us are compliant from the aspect of the legal relationship between us and you. We've been receiving a number of phone calls from people saying, what's going to happen with GDPR, etc., etc. And usually, by the way, the first question is, are you certified for GDPR? There's no such thing. There isn't a certification um, uh, process. This is in, 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 in progress. The next stage on this is going to be the submission of the data processing agreement to all uh, the clients. Okay? But I've mentioned over there the penetration testing also under GDPR, blah, 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 GDPR because even that is part of our compliance because we need to make sure that we can demonstrate um, uh, best practice. The use of Microsoft Azure is also a comfort for us to be able to allow us to ride piggyback on the environment and the GDR, uh, GDPR capabilities with, um, within Microsoft. 